Our reading today comes from Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And we're beginning a new sermon series today on healing. And this passage will uh, start us off. Again, he, that is Jesus, entered the synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him. How to destroy him. The word of the Lord. Well, thanks to Stephen for preaching for us last week. And as I said, this is a new sermon series uh, we're beginning over the next few weeks on healing. As I looked around the world over the last couple of months, I really was just trying to pray and say, God, what are you wanting to say to our church at this time? What should we preach about this month? And it came to me pretty clearly. I felt led to talk about healing. Obviously, it started uh, obviously enough. Our congregation has many in need of healing. We've seen people in our community with good diagnoses and and others in our church who have experienced overwhelming illness leading to death. Our church needs to hear about healing. But it didn't take long to realize how much more we needed to talk about healing, not just in our congregation, but in our world. For the first time in a century, our world is recovering from one great unifying illness. We've seen how fragile we are in these last couple of years. Our world is, is cracking up. There are so many divisions that need healing right at the moment when we most need to gather together. We look deeper and see how much our hearts need healing from hurt or the healing of broken relationships. Even as medicine has grown in its ability to treat disease, we see our mental health, social division, our spiritual alienation, all this suffering. And we long for healing even if we don't really know what it looks like. We pray, we long for healing for our, for our bodies, yes, but also for healing of our hearts, healing of broken relationships, healing of our world and our culture. You know, as I've been thinking about this sermon series and about healing, I keep thinking about the old spiritual. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. To talk about healing, we need to talk about disease, about illness. And to be human, as you know, is to be ill in some way. And we don't quite know what to do with that. As human beings, we always love this image of the healthy human. But most of us will know illness and disease at some point. When I was young, I remember the ad. You probably remember it too. Cold, cold, flu, flu, and there's people depending on you. Soldier on with cultural soldier on. Do you remember those ads? You had people marching to work, people marching their kids to school, you know, officers marching off to work. Do you remember that? It was this idea of grit your teeth. Take your medicine, grit your teeth, and move on. <laughs> What's funny about that is we would never show that ad today. Don't soldier on. It's a terrible idea when you've got the flu, when you have a cold or a flu-like virus, going out into the general population, soldiering on and touching everything, breathing on people. It's a terrible idea. And of course, the truth is sometimes with real illness, with real disease, you can't just soldier on. Gritting your teeth is actually the worst thing you can do when you actually need to go and see a doctor. Pretending the pain isn't there, pretending the suffering isn't there, pretending the illness is not there is not the way to healing. 
I remember I contracted malaria. The long story I'll tell you some other time. But I contracted malaria a few years back and, and I happened to be in London at the time and I went to a hospital and the doctor sort of was so glad that I came in and he got me on fluids and I lay there in bed. But I was anxious because I was in London but I had a flight to catch back home the next day. And so in my, I guess it was a fever dream, I, I said to the doctor, I need to get on a flight tomorrow. Can you just give me the medicine or give me you know, drugs to go and I can fly home and rest up there? And I remember the doctor, he had this wonderful British accent. He looked at me with a quizzical look on his face. And he said, no, you can't go home. You're almost dead. You've got malaria, you idiot. I didn't realize just how bad the situation was. I needed someone to tell me. Disease humbles us. We affect one another when we're diseased and we need one another when we're ill. Now, I've been doing a lot of reading and probably many of you have as well, that during this pandemic, a lot of people looking back into the history of pandemics in the past, to the influenza pandemic, especially of 1918, the Spanish flu, for understanding. During that time, over 25 million people died around the world, but our history books don't have much about it. In some ways, there wasn't much to say. People just died. You know, you go to any town here in New South Wales and you'll see a war memorial erected to the war dead, those forgotten. You can see it in churches, memorial windows for those who died in the war. But for those who desired, died from disease, you don't see that because we don't know what to do with that. It's not as noble a story. Uh, I was reading an author who talked about the doctors of that time and, and one doctor from Tennessee said this during the 1918 Spanish flu plague. He said, give us another war with Germany or any country in preference to another blast of this distressing flu. He said the disease felt like a great merciless juggernaut has rolled over the land and left us weeping and wailing in its path. The motto of the great war was lest we forget but when it came to the great epidemic, people couldn't forget quickly enough. Too much shame, too much weakness, too much powerlessness in the face of disease. Now, it's not been that bad this time around with COVID-19, although I just read in the newspaper that in the US, as many people died of, um, of uh, COVID-19 as more than died in the Spanish flu in America in 1918. That tells us something not just about the sickness of our bodies, but the sickness of our societies. But I think we still feel powerless at the present moment, stuck at home, unable to do much but hide out until help comes. Again, disease humbles us. It reveals our fragility as humans. Illness really is all about how the small things, a virus, a bacteria, a cancerous cell, or more spiritually, a division, an argument, a misunderstanding seems so small at the time, but it can grow and grow until the life of a whole organism is threatened. As I mentioned before, the most serious illness I ever faced was malaria. And in that case, a little mosquito that I could have squashed in an instant laid me in hospital for over two weeks near the point of death. Disease is so insidious, so confounding. In the face of, what did that doctor call it? An uncontrollable juggernaut of death. In the face of this, what do we do? Well, of course, to talk about illness, we need to talk about healing. And we need to talk about the healers. That group of people, some of you, who from before recorded history had had the courage to draw near to the sick, not to run away, to clean away the pus and the blood, to cut open bodies, to learn what went wrong and what might be done about it. Those who worked and studied hard to understand illness and bring healing. Those doctors and nurses and paramedics who today are bearing the load of the pandemic. I had a close friend when I was in seminary who decided about halfway through doing his Masters of Divinity that he would become a doctor instead. And I walked with him early in the morning to his first exams. I have another friend who, who was a theologian and wrote a great book on the uh, book of Romans, but decided later to become a paramedic. Both think they took the better route, and I have to say I don't disagree. Healing is a calling, and commitment to healing is a noble calling. It always means going towards pain and chaos and suffering. One of the most remarkable books of the last few years is a book that perhaps you've heard of. Uh, it's on the treatment of trauma. Perhaps you've heard about it. It's called 
the body keeps the score. It's all about the work of a, a South African, I believe, no, a Dutch doctor called Bessel van der Kolk and his journey towards treating people with trauma and PTSD. I've had it recommended to me so many times and, and eventually I, I found myself meeting so many people who struggled with trauma in their past. And, and so I picked up the book and I expected to find a, a how-to manual, a, a guide to how to work with trauma victims. But what really surprised me, what blew me away really, was the whole first section, which was the doctor's journey of discovery, of how powerless and inadequate he felt to bring healing to those patients he had that were suffering from trauma. These patients with trauma exhibited disturbing and frightening behavior, and they often couldn't be controlled. And when he began in medicine, it, it was really confusing him to know what to do. Van der Kolk talks about the, tr the development of treatment, about the medical model for healing many of these patients. Back in the day, it was things like electroshock therapy or, or Thorazine, brutal treatments that sought to make any impact on the suffering, the confounding suffering of these people. Then he goes on to talk about the advent of the pharmacological revolution. Psychiatric drugs became more and more precise, reducing the need for inpatient mental hospitals and brought relief to the lives of many. Antidepressants, Prozac, Celexa, Cymbalata, Zoloft, antipsychotics, Ablify, and, and many others, maybe you've heard of them, but, but healing had taken another step. These trauma victims were finding the help they needed. Studies were showing that drugs alone were producing better outcomes than the talk therapy. And doctors were so relieved to find something that actually worked. The mess of feelings and relationships and history was broken down into discrete disorders and the brain disease. This is where we get the, um, uh, the, the, the Bible, what they call a Bible for medical disorders, um, the DSM manual. One textbook said that the cause of mental illness is now only considered an aberration of the brain, a chemical imbalance. So the doctor is really uh, profoundly grateful for the use of drugs, but at the same time, he's honest about the limits of those drugs. Each model brought progress, but nothing seemed to really connect, in his uh, understanding, with the victims of trauma, veterans or people who'd experienced violent crime or abuse. Depression and PTSD were still on the rise. Medication was helping dramatically sometimes with the symptoms, and it was calming people, blunting the most extreme behaviors. But unfortunately... What starts out as healing becomes one more means of control. And eventually medicating became over-medicating, dulling the patients. It reduced outbursts, but it settled for a version of healing which was smaller than truly human. It didn't lead to deeper healing. And what I love about the book is that van der Kolk uh, it doesn't have all the answers, but it, he keeps searching. It tells the story of someone searching for real and deep healing, the recovery of the full humanity of these victims of trauma. And this is the gift of the medical field at its best, and maybe you've experienced it like this. In the face of uncontrollable, incomprehensible pain and suffering, doctors have a commitment to healing. Nurses, therapists have a commitment to healing, even when it feels overwhelming. But sometimes, sometimes medicine can devolve from healing and more into just a sense of trying to control the incomprehensible. Van der Kolk at one point as he talks about the ways that over-medication began to happen, he says he gradually realized that how much of our medical professional training was geared to helping us, I want you to hear this, stay in control in the face of terrifying and confusing realities. That makes sense. It's not just doctors. It's easy to despair in the face of illness, to try and smooth it over or hide it away. To participate in healing is a difficult process and often terrifying. It means moving towards people when they're out of control. In the face of illness and disease, we're not sure what to do and we feel overwhelmed. We lose control. The story that we read today Jesus heals a man with the withered hand. And this story itself is all about control as well. Jesus is not just healing in this story, although he does. Jesus is also challenging the control of the religious leaders. 
Healing is easy for Jesus, but Jesus is always doing something else with healing. You'll notice when Jesus goes into a healing miracle, he's never out of control in the face of the disease, but he wants to challenge the control of the people around him. He came to a synagogue, we read, and a man was there with a withered hand. It, it seems simple enough, a man with a disability, trying to pray, trying to worship. But around the man is a group of people, religious leaders, who are using this encounter as a trap. This opportunity for healing is actually a trap, a trap about rule breaking. It's bizarre. Instead of hoping for a miracle, caring about the well-being of this man, hoping for a miracle, they were hoping that Jesus would perform a miracle in order to catch him in breaking the rules. That's a strange mindset, isn't it? Instead of wishing for healing, they wanted Jesus to heal so they could trap him in breaking the rules. Looking for the Sabbath, uh, looking out for the Sabbath was a great rule. Taking rest on God's day, refraining from work, spending time in worship with family. You know, in many ways, Sabbath is an incredibly healing gift. It's what the Sabbath is for, for human flourishing, for human healing. I mean, Let's be honest, how much illness and disease exists today because people don't follow the Sabbath rule. We work too hard. But over time in Jesus' day, this rule moved from being about healing to being about control. Sabbath was not really for restoration anymore. What Sabbath was for is proving that you were a good religious person. Obeying the Sabbath was a way of defining who was in and who was out. And this became especially important for the Jewish people while they were occupied by Rome. It became a rule of control and the leaders were more interested in who was keeping the rules right. In a sense, for them, it didn't matter who got healed. What really mattered was who was in and who was out. And in a confusing world, when disease and, and illness seems so overwhelming, sometimes that's all we can hope for. That's the mindset of these Pharisees. When the choice became between healing and control, they chose control. They chose certainty. They'd rather be the captain of their own destiny than see a miracle happen. So as we get started to talk about healing over the next few weeks, I want to be clear about this. This is the choice that the church always faces. The church can be about healing or the church can be about control. That's the choice that we always face. And Jesus wants to be crystal clear where his priority is. Now, obviously, most churches start out focused on healing. We pray for people, care for people, point people to God. And there are rules, of course, but the rules are designed to help the process of healing. I think of churches I know planted in, in very, very difficult urban uh, areas where there's so much violence and, and brokenness and addiction. Storefront churches, they were often called. And, and they were often strict. They called people out of addiction and adultery and violence. And the preachers would lay down the law. They'd stand up in the pulpit and they'd say, don't do this, don't do that. They were incredibly strict. But their focus was on healing people who were trapped in lawlessness and, and, and overwhelmed by the powers around them. They were looking to heal people, heal whole communities. That's what a good church is about. Healing. It looks out for the weak. It makes allowances for the young. It, it bends over backwards to make sure that someone knows that they're loved, that the grace of Jesus is for them, that the power of God is available, that hope of prayer is available to them. And in these kinds of churches that are seeking to heal people, guess what? They draw broken people. They draw sick people. And there are problems and disagreements. And, and some people don't exactly look like discipleship material. And things aren't always neat in these churches. But these churches live by the faith that God is at work. They hope and pray and labor for transformation. But over time, churches, we can lose that focus on healing. And you know how it happens. Healing is hard. Healing means dealing with, well, get this, broken people. And in God's amazing wisdom and mercy, healing for those people takes a long, long time. And we get, we get tired of praying. We get tired of the mess. We get tired of uncertainty. We get tired of putting up with people who can't get their stuff together. And so we kind of, we kind of just give up on the hope of healing. 
Sometimes churches will even tell the people who don't get healed quickly enough. They tell them to leave. The church stops trying to understand and starts defining instead. We stop trying to heal and we obsess over clarity on, on minor issues of doctrine. We stop being a hospital and we become a fortress. This is one of the reasons that churches lose teenagers because they're more focused on control than they are on healing. This is one of the reasons that churches lose their power and their witness in the community because instead of waiting on God, they start weighing and evaluating people. And people on the outside listen to this and they go, we see what you're about. You're about getting people to conform to your identity, not about healing people. We forget the cry of the human heart. Is there a balm in Gilead? And this, the text tells us, when this happens to churches, it makes Jesus angry. Does that scare you? It scares me. It should. Jesus is not neutral on this matter. He gets angry when the church puts positions over people. Jesus goes straight to the issue. What exactly is your problem, he says to the Pharisees? Don't you want to help people? When Matthew, who tells this same story in his gospel, when he tells this story, Jesus asks if they would do the same thing about their cattle. Jesus says, if a sheep you would own had fallen into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't you help them? Aren't people more valuable than that? Shouldn't we do everything in our power to help them, no matter what day of the week it is? And so Jesus provocatively looks down and heals the man. That's never in question. Jesus has the power to heal and the desire to heal. And the man walks away with a song in his heart and a story to tell. But something deeper happens as well. The battle lines are drawn. There are two opposing forces that Jesus has made clear. Jesus makes them clear. He asks them the question, is it lawful to do harm or to kill on the Sabbath? Are rules for healing the broken or for empowering the leaders? And make your choice, says Jesus. Will you join the team that lives by rules no matter, what they, no matter who they have to kill to enforce them? who think that if we simply demand more, tell people what to do, kick out the wrong people, that we will eventually pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and make ourselves better? These people believe they are saved by the rules, by being in the right crowd, by doing the right thing. And this team, this team of rule holders, it's a big team. It's bigger than you think. You probably didn't notice this in the passage, but there are actually, in verse 6, you read there are two groups that hate Jesus the Herodians and the Pharisees. Now, you probably don't realize this, but these two groups, the Herodians and the Pharisees, they hate each other. Now, it's a little complicated. I don't want to go into all the details, but but the Herodians loved the Romans. They were all about the Romans occupying. And the Pharisees, well, well, they hated the Romans. And these two parties were like two opposite political parties on completely the other ends of the extremes. But now, if you notice in the story, they're in agreement. They both want to kill Jesus to destroy him, says the text. And what brings them together? Well, deep down, although they're on opposite sides of a political issue, they're actually, they're actually on the same team. The team that believes that salvation and hope comes through putting enough rules in place and condemning those who don't follow them. This team doesn't just include Herodians and Pharisees. It includes everyone who thinks that they have all the answers and everyone needs to agree with them. It includes people who think that their life is good because they did all the right things. The people who know how the world works and know how to get results. But Jesus, when Jesus comes, he's forming another team. Now this team doesn't always look all that solid on paper doesn't look all that solid on the field, to be honest. It's not all that athletic. This team doesn't have all the skills or all the answers. It's a motley crew, really. Jesus recruited the man with the withered arm and the blind man and the leper and the lame man. And he picked a woman who lost everything and a guy who had doubts and another one who runs away. We might call them, if we looked at this team, the losers the anxious, the troubled, the doubters. Jesus might call them the poor in spirit, those who mourn and the meek. Not everyone on this team even calls themselves a Christian. And no one on this team calls themselves 
a good Christian. We don't think our theology is just right or we don't think that if our theology is just right or if our prayers are charismatic enough or if our behavior is good enough or that our politics are right enough that healing will come. We believe that Jesus offers healing not because we do the right things or think the right things but because Jesus is filled with grace. And that's what binds Jesus' team together. We have put our trust in the power and the grace of Jesus. Jesus' team trusts that Jesus has the grace and the power to heal and that he heals because he is gracious. And we won't give up on that hope of healing. Jesus may heal in an instant with a miracle to the least deserving people and we won't be shocked. Jesus may heal over a lifetime using doctors and nurses and therapists and friends and we won't be discouraged or impatient. And even if Jesus doesn't heal in this lifetime, we believe that all is well. We rejoice even as we grieve because our Savior and healer, Jesus, is full of grace and power and he showed that healing is beyond death is possible because he went to the grave and three days later he rose again. Perhaps you remember how Paul put it in 2 Corinthians. He says, we don't lose heart, although our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You see, Jesus' team is not cynical and does not give in to despair. We're always praying, always caring, always hoping. We're never dismissing people as too far gone or beyond hope. And even when we fail or stumble in that hope, Jesus, well, Jesus heals us too because that's who he is. He's not the rule giver. He's the healer. He didn't come to bring more rules. He came to bring healing. And we won't give up on that hope of healing. We'll keep choosing healing. And, and I think, I think at, at our best, that's this church. I think that's us. We don't have all the answers and we're a weird mob, as Nerida says. But we're okay living in this tension knowing that we don't have control, but we're still trusting that there's healing available, that there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole, a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. So as the song continues, don't ever feel discouraged because Jesus is your friend. And if you lack for knowledge, he'll not refuse to lend. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.